Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the West Arundelcourt Central PTSA's Candidates Night. The Board of Education in West Arundelcourt is composed of seven community residents who are elected by voters for a three-year term. The Board of Education is the official policy-making body for the school district. The board's responsibilities include establishing an educational philosophy for the district, adopting policies for the operation of the school system, setting goals and objectives that foster educational progress and developing sound financial plans that balance educational needs and community resources. Three seats are up for election on May 18th and we have five candidates running. The PTSA holds an annual candidates night so that voters have an opportunity to learn about candidates' backgrounds, views, and qualifications. Thank you to our five candidates for being willing to volunteer and serve our district, community, and most importantly, our children. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Sherry Johnson, who is the Executive Director of the Monroe County School Boards Association. Good evening, Sherry. Good evening. And I also want to thank and welcome all of you to the West Arondequoit Central School District Meet the Candidate Night. I especially want to thank the West Arondequoit PTSA for hosting this evening's event and also the West Arondequoit Central School District for their support in getting this out to the community. I do need to announce that candidate Diane White is not available to participate in the candidate night this evening, but we do have in ballot order, Mr. Bruce Kassler, Ms. Rosa Vargas Cronin, Mr. Matt Metris, and Mr. Justin Connor. Tonight's format will go as follows. Each candidate will have three minutes to make an opening statement in the order that they appear on the ballot. After those statements, the candidates will be asked the four questions that they were provided by the PTSA. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer all of those questions and questions will be directed to the candidates in rotating order so that each candidate will have the opportunity to answer question first. Then we will go back to ballot order for the closing statement of two minutes. Candidates, we do have two rules for engagement this evening. First, please watch the timekeeper. Maureen will hold up a card we held uh, up with one minute remaining. 30 seconds um, will be another card. And when time is up, a stop card will be held. Uh, so when you see those cards, we ask that you begin to finish up your answer. Secondly, while this candidate night is designed to help the community understand how your platform ideas or viewpoints might differ from others, I am asking you to be respectful and to not call out or criticize any specific, specific individuals. Thank you. So with that, we are ready to get to the opening statement. And Mr. Bruce Kessler, you get to go first with three minutes. Hello, my name is Bruce Kessler and I've had an ongoing conversation about issues in this election with people on Facebook. It's going on sale well to election day on the Arondequoit Real Issues Discussion Board. Please feel free to join. If you don't have Facebook, well, you can get it and close it out after we're done. It's just a good way in today's world to stump and share ideas. My platform document, as well as other links and documents I will speak of tonight are available on that Facebook group, are available by demand by emailing me at educatenewyork at outlook.com. I will also be having Zoom town hall meetings that will be administrated through those two methods. I want to state right from the beginning that our next three or so elections will not be business as usual. We need to make changes to how we do business. You need to bring your family into discussion. You need to get your friends into discussion. Heck, we need everybody in this discussion. If we buckle down in the next three years, we can make substantive change to taxes, to school performance, and to respecting parents as equal in the process. It's important. Now, I've lived in the West Rondequoit School District for 29 years. My wife, Patricia Gravelin, who went to West Rondequoit, and I have three and a half kids we put through the district. I work as a Microsoft system engineer for the, my company for the past 18 years. Alrighty. And it's my job to implement large software and hardware systems that touch many departments and therefore many people often have separate wishes, desires, and wants. I oversee and run those projects and implement them to meet those needs. When something goes wrong, it's my job to figure out why. It's a puzzle, a maze, that you have to work with others to see the diverse factors and interoperabilities to say, oh, the issue is 
and fix it or get the department to fix it. That's what I do at work and what I can do for the board as a board of education member. Now, people have asked about the victim behind my two sons in my bio. The answer to that question is how I got started with activism for school reform and then my run for the board. In fall of 2018, my son went through a kangaroo court we call school justice, also known as superintendent's hearing, and was wrongly convicted of threatening the school. My son Snapchatted, don't get mad when you regret it and keep your cams ready Monday, I'm going viral. No reference to violence, no reference to school, no reference to, well, anything. But some kids who had it out for him or just wanted to punk the school used the anonymous tip line and social media to create a frenzy. The school overreacted to a non-existent problem and then to save face, they had to show they were tough and they suspended him for 12 months. Now, full disclosure, my son is currently in a First Amendment lawsuit against the district, but it's important that you know if there's any need for the board to, board to vote on any issue related to that, I obviously will not be voting. This run for the board is not about my son. I only use him as an example, that one sadly that has been repeated many times in our district. But I don't want to focus on this too much and make you think I'm a single issue candidate. This issue is not even one, two, or three on my platform statement, but we can talk more if you like. The reason I brought up now is just to get the elephant out of the room so that we can talk and move forward. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And Ms. Rosa Vargas Cronin, your opening statement of three minutes, please. Good evening. <clears throat> thank you, um, West Rondequite PTSA, for putting this event together. Um, thank you, Sherry Johnson, Jeff T. Martin, De Veronica, and, and to all of those that could tune in tonight. Um, my husband and I actually moved to West Rondequite. Um, it's going to be 10 years in July. I still can't believe it. Um, but we moved up from New York City, um, downstate, and um, it was definitely the best decision we ever made. Um, at the time, we had an active three-year-old boy and a one-year-old girl. I remember our first amazing Arondequoi memory was attending the 4th of July celebrations at Town Hall. Um, it was so memorable and it definitely solidified our reason for moving here. Um, we loved the school district. That's definitely something that we researched extensively before making our decision. And it was definitely the type of school district that we wanted our children to be in. Um, my son, Gael, is now a seventh grader at Dake. My daughter, Raquel, is at a fourth grader at Rogers Middle School. Um, they both went to Briarwood and um, they both went to Rogers as well. Um, I'm currently a, a board of trustee member for the Irondequoit Library. Um, and I think that's really kind of given me the, since 2018, um, given me the the hands-on experience of what being a board member and a true uh, team player is all about. Um, I've also been a member of the, um, it's, called, it's called ERASE, but it stands for Eliminating Racism and Seeking Equity in Irondequoit. And I'm also a part of Eye Care, which um, are all equity and diversity groups um, uh, in Irondequoit. I'm currently working for um, the city of Rochester as a bilingual speech and language pathologist. Um, I'm an educator. I've been an educator for 20 years now, half my life. And I'm, it's really driven my passion for running for, um, for school board. I really want to always have my educator head on and be able to um, really improve and put our, our school district back to our pre-academic um, effectiveness. Um, I think the social emotional well-being of our students and parents and our staff members is, is really um, key and my top priority. The last two years have been very difficult and, um, and I definitely want us to all work together to get back to where we were. Thank you. And Mr. Matt Metris, 30 seconds, opening statement, please. Good evening. My name is Matt Metris, and I currently serve as the Vice President of the West Arondequoit Board of Education. Thank you to Mr. DeVeronica, Maureen, and the PTSA for hosting us tonight. 
Also, thank you to Sherry Johnson, not just for moderating tonight, but for her tireless and continual work on advocacy for public education and to all my fellow candidates for participating in this process. My primary motivation for running for re-election to the Board of Education is to maintain the long-term success and viability of our district and to make sure our children have the greatest educational opportunities possible here in West Irondequoit. For the last three years, I've had the privilege of serving as a board member. It has truly been an informative experience. I thought I had a solid understanding of what it took to keep a district like ours moving forward, but I had only scratched the surface. In that time, our board has done great work, but we continue to face new challenges and know our work is never complete. I'm here tonight asking for an opportunity to continue this work as we advocate for the additional funding and relief from unfunded mandates, as we strengthen and build upon our work around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and as we embark on the five-year strategic planning process. This year, I had the opportunity to serve as co-chair of the Monroe County School Boards Association Legislative Committee. Our committee has effectively advocated with our state legislators for their commitment to fully fund foundation aid, something public education advocates have been trying to secure for over a decade. I've worked extensively to successfully build relationships between our district and our state legislators and regents in Albany. I grew up here in Irondequoit. I've lived in multiple towns and the city here in Monroe County and in two other cities in the state. But when it came time to start a family, my wife and I chose to return here to Irondequoit, not only for the school system, but because of the welcoming and close-knit community. I have a son in third grade at Liswood, and my wife is a public school teacher in the city. I believe I have unique experiences that are beneficial to the board. I'm a small business owner. I have a tax and accounting practice, and my financial background can be valuable in the budgetary process. Prior to starting my business, I managed a nonprofit where I had the responsibility to develop and implement a multi-million dollar annual budget. In summation, the totality of my experience makes me a strong candidate for board, but most importantly, I believe in public education. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Justin Connor, your opening statement for three minutes, please. My name is Justin Connor, and I would be honored to serve on the West Irondequoit School Board. I'm proud to call myself a product of the West Irondequoit Central School District. I attended Listwood, Iroquois, Dake, and IHS throughout the late 70s and through the 80s, with my wife and I both graduating from IHS in 1990. My three brothers all attended West Irondequoit schools as well, graduating in 85, 86, and 88. In all, I have lived in this district for 39 of my 48 years. After college, my wife and I moved to California where I worked as a physical therapist and my wife attended graduate school and started her career in counseling. After my oldest son was born in 2004, we immediately started planning our return to Irondequoit because we could think of no other place we wanted to raise our family. The welcoming community of Irondequoit and the high quality education provided here was what we wanted for our children. I have two sons, Justin and Bailey, who have both attended school here in Western Irondequoit at Seneca, Iroquois, and Dake. Bailey is about to start his high school career at IHS this coming fall, and Justin will be a senior next year at IHS. I always enjoyed attending with our sons as a parent volunteer on school field trips to the museum, the planetarium, the nature center, but serving on the board would be my first opportunity to participate in a district-wide effort as my wife did when she served with the Central PTSA. I have spent eight years coaching for the Irondequoit Soccer Club and five years as the president of the Irondequoit Soccer Club, working with and serving the youth of Irondequoit and their parents. At ISC, we emphasize sportsmanship and teamwork above winning because sports are a great way to help youth learn how to work together as a team to achieve a goal and gives kids the opportunity to establish relationship with kids from other backgrounds, all things that I feel the West Irondequoit schools also encourage. I have worked for Rochester Regional Health as a physical therapist in Irondequoit since 2005, providing care and improving the health of the, commu of the Irondequoit community. As a manager who also has to provide patient care, I have developed the ability to multitask and become adept at communication with my patients and my staff. The world of healthcare is ever-changing and ever-evolving, 
So I have also developed a strong ability to roll with the punches and quickly adapt to the new environment. I'm running for school board because I want to continue to serve the community that has been so integral to my development. The youth of our community are our future leaders and innovators and the schools they attend will shape them and provide them the skills they will need to make this world a better place. I would love to have the opportunity to contribute to the ongoing efforts of this district to provide an exceptional educational experience to the youth of West Durant Lake. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will get on to the questions from the PTSA. We will go back to the top of the ballot order and to the audience. I have been given permission to use first names, which I will be doing that. So Bruce, question number one, uh, and you get this first. What do you see as the major challenges facing public education in general? And how do these challenges relate to West Durand oh, Thank you for the question. So public education has always been plagued by money. Now I'm not saying we should just throw money at it, but we do need to invest. It's a tale of two cities. We have well-off schools that prosper and less affluent ones that don't. And the biggest key to that is not the money, is that many of the young kids going to the less affluent schools are not prepared. And they have never prepared their parents to be able to have their children prepared. And so the cycle continues. These kids are behind and not able to catch up and just can't let the others, we just can't let the others who are prepared wait. Those really formative years up to age five are lost and not, cannot be made up easily. Then kids get into trouble because they act up. The schools are set up as prosecutors to handle it, not as educators. This is in essence the, the definition of the school to jail pipeline. And these exist. Issues exist in our school district as well. We need to focus back in on education using restorative practices. In essence, we need to teach our way out of these issues rather than lamely relying on punishment. Punishment should only set the kids further down the rabbit hole rather than lifting them up. Restorative practices are real, they work, and they deserve more than the lip service given them in our district. Also in schools across the state, as well as in our own district, they have not done the proper job of following the state law when it comes to calling CPS. Our district has ruled that they don't try to understand the issue, they just call CPS. Now, nobody, I mean nobody, wants to stop a call that needs to be made. But there are clear guidelines in regards to what constitutes a need for a call, and the school does not follow them. They want to push their job as mandatory reporters onto an already overburdened CPS system to remove the school from some perceived liability. This places an unneeded burden on families and family cohesion. Easy enough to fix. Educator or manager reporters the law and follow it, and then have an ongoing review process done by the board for compliance. Next, I know one parent that has CPS to call because they threatened to take away their kids' toys. They didn't even actually take away any, only threatened to. That should not happen. The 14th Amendment says that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law or deny any person within its just uh, jurisdiction the equal protection of the law, and that includes schools. They cannot make rules that abridge the Constitution rights or state laws. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Rosa, two minutes, please, same question. Okay, so there are definitely many challenges that um, that we face, that any school district faces. Anywhere from student achievement, curriculum, government, governance, technology, there, there really is a, a big, a, a load of them. <laughs> um, what I really wanna focus on, especially um, focusing on West Ronacoy specifically, um, is really um, honing in on the challenges that this pandemic has brought up. Um, and the biggest one, that I've seen and that I've um, experienced is the social emotional um, well being of our students and our staff. Um, it has, it is being addressed now, uh, I've seen with the seventh through 12th graders um, with, during their peak time. I know that social emotional um, teachings and curriculum is, is being looked at at, at the district level and, and the board as well. Um, but that really was something that drew me to, to um, running for the board because I really wanted to make sure that these areas are addressed also with our, our younger learners um, from our K through 
through sixth graders, um, because that's actually where I've seen most of the need um, for them to be able to um, be able to be heard, to be able to be seen, and to feel included in this new um, in this new era that we're teaching and, and learning in. You know, it's it's difficult for us as adults. So definitely, I want that to um, be one of the the things that I look at as a board member. Um, definitely looking at areas of, of inequity in our, in our district. We saw a lot of that um, in, in our technology. A lot of our families didn't have Wi-Fi or the ability to connect um, during the pandemic. And, and that was definitely an area that I also kind of saw and focused on um, that we need to work on as, as a district. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, Matt, same question, two minutes. There are many challenges facing public education in general, which also impact us here at West Aronicoit. The biggest issue currently is the pandemic. Right now, we have a preliminary vision of what the fall will look like. But as we've seen, changes occur often and quickly. Will we quote unquote, be quote unquote back to normal? Uh, by pre-pandemic standards? Will we still be masking? Will we have a remote option? Will variants have forced us to regress in our goal of being fully reopened? Uh, planning for a new school year is already a heavy lift. Because of COVID, we have to plan for multiple contingencies, requiring even more work and stress being placed on our staff. Additionally, we have to navigate this treacherous path with conflicting or limited guidance. We never know week to week when the rules will change and if we will need to follow what the county, the state or the federal government is telling us to do. We saw many other local districts recently order thousands of dollars of physical barriers to meet state distancing requirements, only to have the state change the rules a week later and remove barriers as an option. We need transparent, timely guidance that is cohesive across levels of government so we can focus on what we do best, educating our students. Another major challenge is public sentiment around public education in general. A year ago, people declared that teachers should be making a million dollars a year for all the work that they do. Now the pendulum has swung the other way and teachers and school districts are again being vilified for following state guidelines. We must work together to change the public, the perception of public education. A challenge specific to West Aronicoit is our small commercial tax base. In many communities, commercial businesses carry a much larger share of the property tax burden. In our community, that's not the case. As a result, any increase to the property tax levy is distributed more substantially to our homeowners compared to neighboring towns. We as a board must remain continually aware of the impact of property taxes, especially among our lower income residents. Thank you. Thank you. And Justin, two minutes, please. Um, funding is the consistent challenge uh, facing public ed education and in turn the West Rondequite Central School District. Unfunded mandates force districts to shift funds away from programs that enhance the student experience. Things like the pandemic can cause state and federal funding to be reduced, further hampering the school's ability to offer all the programs that will benefit the students. The current board has done a great job lobbying um, our representatives at the state level, and it has led to the state promising to fully fund Foundation 8, which is a huge boost to the district. I wanna continue what this board has done with working with our representatives in Albany to advocate and fight for all the funding the district deserves. Being prepared for more occurrences like the, pa the pandemic that can severely alter the way we provide our students with their education, social emotional learning, rapid technological advances, advances are all challenges that face public education in Western Underquade and around the country around the county, state, and country. One challenge that faces public education in general in the West Toronto schools that is important to me personally is implicit and unconscious bias. As a father of biracial children and a husband of an African American, I am acutely aware of implicit bias and how it impacts people of color in all aspects of life. I see it in the healthcare field where I work and it is present in the schools as well. This district has begun to make positive strides towards addressing implicit bias by establishing, race, establishing relationships with the local group race, as well as with the development of the Coalition on Diversity and Equity and investigating anti-racist curriculum. There is so much more work to do in this area and I wanna be a part of that work. 
I feel I can bring a unique perspective to the table. Thank you. The second question, and Rosa, you get this one first. As a member of the Board of Education, what will be your top two priorities? Two minutes. Okay. Um, so definitely as, as a Board of Education member for Western Andacoy, I my main priority is to be a representative and an advocate um, for our diverse student body. Um, Actually, one of the main reasons I ran is because my son um, brought up to me the lack of diversity in our, our staff members and, and in our district. Um, so I definitely want him, them to be able to look at me and see themselves and, and definitely be seen. Um, my other priority, like I said before, was the social emotional well being um, of our students and staff and our community as a whole. Um, as a parent and as an educator, um, going through the past two years has been very difficult. And, um, and I've seen that with my kids as well. So I definitely want that to be a very heavily addressed um, in our school district. Um, and, and, I, and it is, I, I, I see positive um, moves towards it. I see our curriculum being changed so it could be more representative of, of the different um, groups that we have in our community. And, and I'm very hopeful and I definitely wanna be a part of uh, those changes and, and make sure that um, my, my community and my children's voices are heard. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, you get this question second. My first priority continues to be our students. Kids are the purpose for this work. It is the responsibility of our district and our board to educate, nurture, and develop our students into the adults of tomorrow. The pandemic has highlighted the need to prioritize the social, emotional, and mental well being of our students. Our kids have experienced stressors in this last year that were never an issue when all of us were in school. We need to make sure we are acknowledging, supporting, and mitigating those needs not just now, but ongoing, which leads to number two. My second priority is long-term, predictable, and sustainable funding. Everything stems from funding. The ability to create new programs, including social emotional learning, the ability to fairly compensate our staff, the ability to navigate a pandemic. This time last year, we were making difficult decisions to close a $900,000 budget gap as a result of COVID and bracing for another three to five million in additional cuts. A year later, we're looking at $14 million of quote unquote new money, most of which has strings attached. While this injection of foundation aid is a one time fix, the long term funding model remains systemically broken. We cannot raise revenue at the same rate as our increase in expenses without supermajority support of the community. So every year, we need to find more places to trim just to maintain the programs we currently have in place. Eventually, we will run out of those efficiencies. I will continue to advocate on behalf of our district with our state and federal elected officials to develop new funding models that prioritize education. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Well, as I mentioned previously, um, diversity and, inc and inclusion along with ending implicit bias will be one priority for me. Uh, working with the administration to find ways to bring more leadership, faculty and staff into the district that truly represent the diversity of the Aroundacoit community is very important to me. There were more teachers of color in this district when I went to school here than there are now, but the community has become significantly more diverse in the last 30 years since I graduated. Our faculty and staff need to reflect our students. Our BIPOC students need to see teachers and staff that look like them. If we want more BIPOC teachers in the future, our BIPOC students need to see that becoming a teacher is a real possibility for them by having BIPOC teachers to give them that example. Our white students need to have teachers and staff that look different than them to best align them to the real world. All the reading I have done on implicit bias says that the greater exposure that a person has to people different than them, the greater their understanding of others gets and the more accepting they become of other races and religions and cultures. It broadens their exposure and helps to eliminate their implicit bias. It prepares them for the greater world out there. I know this is not an easy task and the district administration 
has been working diligently towards this goal. There's a teacher shortage and especially a shortage of BIPOC teachers, but I would like to work with the administration on finding creative ways to entice and encourage more BIPOC teachers to come to teach in this district. Another priority of mine will be working to expand further the district's support for students for whom college may not be the right option. I know the district already offers great programs and courses that expand a student's education in the trades, and I would make it a priority to try to grow this even further. We like to see the great numbers every year about how many of our students are going out onto two and four year schools after graduation. I would see, like to see what we can do as a district to have amazing numbers of the remaining kids not heading to college, getting into excellent careers because of the programs we provide and the leaks we can develop with the community. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Well, it's obvious at this point that some of the things I think are important, but you might be surprised they're not the top issues. Why? Because they're easy to fix. School admins stop doing this. School admins start doing this, and we are watching. Our number one priority is high taxes and poor results. I might say that's two things, which I would say, are they? We are second in taxes only to keep Toronto going, but we're 14th in teacher pay and 25th in how much we spend per student. Where's the money going? I base these numbers on the Rochester Business Bureau's annual school report for 2020. I have links to that here in the previous three years, which you can get in the email or Facebook page I mentioned. The previous three years are just as bad. Not only the excuse of cherry picking, our science numbers were good, very good, but we're 12th in reading's performance. Dake was 16th in English and had a 48% rating, while Barker Woods School in Tetchford was 82%. Dake was 19th in math with a whopping 27%. While Compton's old school was 70% and Barber Road was 66. And I do not have time in this format to go through them all or explain the ratings, but you can and should look at them. So the question is why? And therein, what is the science department doing that is so right? Why are we not doing that in other departments? From the conversations I've had, we've had teacher retention problems. Why? I've also heard that initiatives coming out from our ground soldiers on the war against ignorance, our teachers, are brushed away summarily. So low pay and lack of respect, is that a winning combination to keep good employees? Why would they want to work here if they get more money and be heard elsewhere? I wish I had a better answer here. We need to dig deeper and use all the resources to come up with a plan. The key to fixing anything is knowing it's broken and being willing to work on it. I know it's broken and we will work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Question three, Matt, you get this one first. What is the best way to address differences of opinion on the board? The Board of Education is a team. We all bring different skills, perspectives, experiences, and priorities. It follows that we won't all approach each issue the same way. So differences of opinion are natural. The best way to address this is to ensure each member's concerns are respected and heard. Seek first to understand and then be understood. Without understanding someone else's perspective, it isn't possible to understand the entirety of the issue. Once all parties have presented their positions, then the board can work towards consensus where concerns are addressed. From my personal perspective, the driving essential question behind any decision making must be, is this what's in the best interest of students? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Justin, you get this question second. Uh, for me, this one is pretty easy. Um, as the husband of a mental health professional, I have learned that open communication is the key. This board already has a great reputation for having excellent communication and being able to consistently come to a compromise. As long as everyone has the best interest of the students and the community in mind, we can always come to an agreement. Everyone needs to be prepared to share their ideas and opinions openly and be able to actively listen to others with no prejudging. Everyone needs to have an open mind and be willing to look at all the ideas and facts presented and disengage from their personal feelings around a topic or issue, and come to an agreement about what will best serve the students and the community. Each person on the board has a unique viewpoint and a unique perspective. And if the environment is a positive one that encourages sharing of ideas, and not a negative one that shuts down discussion, it makes it much easier to settle differences and make the right decision to advance the district. Thank you. 
Thank you, Bruce. Next. As you can tell from what I said, this may be an issue that may come up. All the way it's probably that has rules of engagement and then vote. I only have one vote. So it's upon me to help others see the merit of my position. Since we are elected officials, we answer for the people who pay their taxes. For too long, we have let the board, as I say, off the hook because we would not have been as present involved as we could be. Another way to persuade is not to do it yourself, but let the constituents come out and speak. But that depends on an active and involved constituent. But part of the reason they haven't been involved, people haven't been involved, I believe, is they speak and the board does not listen. As I said, in our next three years, we can make substantive changes with elections and with our voice. But if we are absent parents to our board, we'll have a wayward board children. You have to think of it as spring cleaning. It's been a long time coming and it needs to be done. And once it's done, you feel better about it and then it's easier to keep it clean. Kind of basic question, doesn't it? I know one thing that won't happen. And the documents they give you when they think you might want to be on the board, it says once the board's happened, you have to get on the board on, on board and support it. Is that what happened when budgets were passed in multiple years that the state control state controller called them illegal? Did somebody know and not say something? I will not be that kind of board member. If I know, you will know. And what's worse, they knew and did it anyhow, or they didn't know. The synopsis of that report is available and I will share it with you. The same document also says that if you're an advocate, Maybe it's best you don't run for the board because the ship turns slowly. Well, if you don't go up and grab the wheel, the ship doesn't turn at all. So I will be there and try and, and guide us back into safer, calmer waters. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Same question. As a member of the board, I, I definitely um, Communication would be my, at the forefront for me at all times. Um, as a speech and language pathologist, I call myself a communication expert. Um, and definitely the most important part of communication is listening. Um, so I definitely want to start my tenure um, if I'm elected listening, listening to um, what the other board members is are you know building those relationships um and if there are differences being able to talk through them and communicate um through them and that means listening you know before you speak and and really taking in what the other person's ideas and and um mindset is again like i said um i'm a board of trustee member for the library the Rhonda Court Library, and that has really kind of trained me <laughs> to um, have open ears and an open mind always when I come to the board meetings, um, because my ideas are not the only ones there. There's eight individuals with the superintendent, so we need to um, be able to come to consensus, and that would be my priority if I'm elected to the board. Thank you. Okay, the fourth question, Justin, you get this one first. Do you support the district's proposed budget? Please explain why, and if not, what changes would you make? Yes, I, I do support the budget. Um, this, district, this district has some unique challenges. There's not much, if any, development in Western Rondequay, so new homes are not being built like in other districts, and that limits the growth of revenue this district can bring in. As Matt mentioned earlier, there's also uh, not a lot of property tax coming in from the commercial sector as well. Um, this district has a history of operating very lean, and they have done a fantastic job of keeping under the 2% tax cap. This budget includes an increase from the state and foundation aid, which is a huge boost to the district. The administration did an amazing job this year, making last minute adjustments, adjustments to this budget due to the state budget passing. I attended the last few board meetings where the budget was being discussed and finalized, and this budget hits all the district's objectives. It keeps the tax levy below the tax cap rate, it restores and keeps all the programs with no cuts, and due to the increased foundation aid, it allows us to add to our reserves, which helps us for the future. So I wholeheartedly support this, this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce, you get this one next. Uh, 
Okay, so budgets as they are presented to us are really just a smoke and mirror show. We had multiple years where the state controller called our budgets illegal and we never knew. It's hard without being in there and seeing the actual pieces to tell exactly where, where they fit in. If I'm, a vote, if I'm elected, I will get in there and dig into it, make sure that we have a fair, safe budget and that everybody's issues are addressed. The veterans who think that they should get a tax break certainly should consider it. The homeowners that want relief from the taxes that, you know, the overburden of taxes, we definitely need to be able to answer them. Well, we're getting our money. What's happening with it? So it's hard to say that this budget is good or bad. There's just not enough information given out in regards to it. But if I'm elected, I will find that information and I will make sure that it's fair, even, and equitable. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Same question. Hey, um, I do support the proposed budget for the next school year. Um, I have a close friend that actually came over this weekend from Trumansburg. It's like it's just an hour and a half uh, south from us near Ithaca. And the proposed budget is nine percent. Uh, increase in, in their budget. And, you know, I almost went a little crazy when I heard that. Um, so I do, I do feel that the, the objectives that our budget is centered around is something that are all ideals that, that I am for. Um, an increase of 2.70, I'm sorry, 2.67% seems very reasonable to me. Um, I am all about fiscal responsibility, especially working for the Rochester City School District. Um, I've had to become very versed in budgets and, and spending and what that means to a school district. Um, so I will definitely make sure that, um, that our budget is um, reasonable and that our our most vulnerable learners are not affected by any kind of cuts that we would have to make um, to their to their learning. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. You get this one last. Yes, I support the budget. I voted for it on the record. This budget restores all of the pandemic related cuts made to the current year's budget to fully support our students and staff. This was an extraordinarily difficult year to develop a budget. When we reviewed the governor's executive budget in January, we prepared for a third year in a row of flat state aid. West Aronicoit has historically been shorted roughly $10 million per year under the unfunded foundation aid formula. We never could have expected that we would end up with the state legislature committing to a three-year phase in to fully funding foundation aid. I wanna thank our board members, the members of other local boards, Monroe County School Boards Association, NISA, and the New York PTSA for all of their advocacy work with our state legislators for foundation aid. I especially wanna thank our local legislators, Assembly Member Sarah Clark and Senator Somer Brook. They went to bat for us and they came up big. They summarily rejected the governor's additional cuts in sleight of hand with state aid. With this budget, we are also able to take some pressure off of our taxpayers. With this additional aid, we were able to reduce the originally planned tax levy increase by 50%. So our levy is 0.72%, far below the 2% tax cap. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Johnson, Mrs. Bre Mr. Brennan, Ms. Kramer, and all of our staff that developed the budget and were able to pivot at the 11th hour to accommodate all of these new changes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go back up to the top of the order and Bruce, your closing statement of two minutes. I want to say I, I truly uh, love that we're talking about bias on here. It is an important and integral part to having um, critical thinkers moving forward. Um, just, it has to be done with an even hand and done in such a way as not to demonize others. Uh, it's a complicated uh, subject that has 
uh, layers in economics and everything else. But it is essential for us to move forward as a people to have critical thinkers that can understand and, and make choices. Um, in regards to uh, the budget, it, it's nice that we got the money. I'm kind of in fear of what's going to be happening with it. Um, as I say, that uh, um, it, it, so the past experience with these things makes me wary. I hope that it works out, but not being in there, it's hard to tell where the issues actually are. In regards to this full reform, it's essential. Our constitution says that you, you have to have independent adjudicators. It says you have to have discovery. Why is the school district different? CPS calls. Why are we why are we forcing this un, uh, you know uh, un mandated you know burden on the CPS system and also hurting families? The guidelines are there. Educate the guidelines and follow them. As for our education, uh, how we're going to get that up? Uh, it, it'd be nice to have a solid answer and go, oh, this, this, and this. Unfortunately, without having your hands in there, it's hard to hard to fix the engine. So. Uh, definitely working with the teachers and the other other staff, educational staff, to come up with a plan and be able to uh, implement and, and get those grades up is the is the key thing that we need to do as a district to be able to to move forward. And uh, as for being on the board, it wasn't something I really aspired to, but I believe in service. That's why I've been in Albany multiple times to advocate for uh, stopping the school jail pipeline working with the uh, state PTA to get the Judge Judith uh, K. Safe and Supported School Act enacted. Uh, these are changes that, the restorative practices, these are changes that are essential to move into a modern educational system and go away from our kind of our old spare the rod, spoil the child kind of uh, attitude. And I hope I have a chance to be able to speak on this with the other board members and convince them that this will go out. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Rosa, your closing statement, please. Okay. Um, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, as I said before, just kind of closing everything up. Um, following the challenges of of the pandemic and everything that we've that it's highlighted um, through our community, um, through our uh, learning objectives, I think we really need to rethink what what it is that we envision when we think about student achie achievement. Um, you know, we usually think about assessment scores and, and numbers and, and percentages, but we really do need to rethink that mindset and including the social emotional well being of our students and our staff. Um, you know, that doesn't, it's really hard to. Put that in a percentage. Um, so we really need to kind of think about, you know, different creative ways to to be able to address that um, in our school district. Um, again, areas that that are very important to me are um, equity and inclusion. I want all of our students to feel um, like they're part of our community and that they can strive for the best in as citizens of, of West Arundacoit. Um, and I also want to really give back to, uh, I feel like the amazing job that the teachers and staff at West Arundacoit have done for my children. Um, I know my son came into West Arundacoit kindergarten very, um, in need of instruction and guidance and love and he got that from the teachers and and it really transformed his uh, his complete his educational career completely and i see him now as a 13 year old and, and i'm so happy for for this district and i definitely want to give back as a board member thank you um, matt your closing statement please First of all, thank you to everyone who took time out of their day to watch this. Uh, I wish we could have had the opportunity to do this in person. Uh, it's a much better format than on Zoom. Thank you to all my fellow candidates for participating in this and for putting yourselves forward uh, to serve our community. Uh, 
Thank you to Sherry for moderating and to the PTSA for hosting this event. I also wanna express how proud I am of our district and how proud I am to live in Irondequoit. First and foremost, I'm a member of this community. I live and work here. I desire to see this district continue to flourish for decades to come. I'm asking for your support to continue the great work of our board and district. I will continue to fight for the funding we were owed. I will work to push forward our work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I will strive to maintain West Irondequoit as a top-notch environment for educating and nurturing our students and maintaining the highest quality educators and staff. I also strongly believe that continuity of service and my experience on the board is beneficial during these difficult times. Our district has created a strong, solid budget, restoring all pandemic related cuts. This is what our children need and deserve. So I implore you, come out and vote on May 18th to show your support for this budget. If you wanna vote for me while you're there, I would appreciate it. Polls are open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. at the St. Paul Fire Department, 433 Cooper Road. Thank you. Thank you. And Justin, your closing statement, please. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you, Sherry, and thank you, Maureen. Um, I want to thank the West Rondequite Central PTSA for putting this on this evening. Um, I just want to express my, my desire to, to continue to serve this community. Um, as I said, I was raised here, born and raised here. I grew up in the West Rondequite Central Schools. Um, really appreciated the excellence in education that's always been a priority here in this community. Um, and I, I've lived and worked here as an adult and I've contributed to this, this community um, over those years. And I wanna continue that process uh, on this level. I wanna add to what the board has done. Nothing's perfect, obviously, and there's always room for improvement. And I'd love to be able to have a say in that and to help uh, progress this board along, progress this district along. Um, and it really comes down to the kids and the education. Um, I, want, I want to take this opportunity to, to continue to serve this community and con continue to serve the youth of Irondequoit because I see them really as, as our future and our, our innovators and our leaders of the future. Thank you. Thank you. This actually now concludes my portion of the candidate night, but I do want to thank all of our candidates here tonight for your thoughtful responses and your willingness to serve in this capacity, providing community residents the opportunity to listen to the viewpoints of those that are asking to serve as elected board trustees is key to participating in our democratic process as an informed voter. I will now turn it back over to the West Rondequoit PTSA for their final remarks. Thanks, Sherry. Thanks again to our candidates for your willingness to dedicate your time and talents to our community to Sherry Johnson for moderating, and to Jeff D. Veronica and the district for their help in getting this out there. Please remember to vote on May 18. It will be held at the St. Paul Boulevard Fire Department located at 433 Cooper Road. The polls are open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Residents will be voting on the 2021-2022 school budget and three seats on the board. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>